Jesus predicts his death. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, uh, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honour the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on the world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Well, hello again, St Nick's. If you're just joining us for the sermon only video, then I'm in the outer vestry uh, in church. If you want to know why, then watch the beginning of the all-in-one service. And I found an old uh, drumming stool, which I hope will hold out for this sermon. I've actually become very lazy as a preacher over lockdown, uh, and I hope just one particular way, uh, which is this. I have not preached a sermon standing up since March the 15th. Why pray? There are lots of different ways to answer that important question. However, one answer that has always stuck with me is the answer that the author Philip Yancey gives in his book on prayer. I'm not sure I ever actually finished the whole book, but this was near the beginning. Uh, Yancey says, if I had to answer the question, why pray, in one sentence, it would be this. Because Jesus did. Why pray? Because Jesus did. Over the summer at St Nick's, we are looking at some of the prayers of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels. His prayers are a reason, an inspiration, and a model for our prayers. Across the four Gospels, we find 17 references to Jesus praying, both describing when and where he prayed, and on occasion, what he prayed. Most of his recorded prayers are very short. Last week, we looked at a very brief two-sentence prayer from Matthew chapter 11. One of his recorded prayers is much longer. That's what we're looking at next week. John chapter 17, the whole chapter, Jesus' high priestly or farewell prayer. This week, we're in John chapter 12. And uh, we have two prayers of Jesus in this one passage. There is a prayer that Jesus didn't pray, and there's a prayer that Jesus did pray. We'll, we'll think more about that in just a minute. This passage takes place right after Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And we read at the beginning, verse 20, uh, about some Greeks who had come up to Jerusalem for the festival and who wanted to meet this miracle worker, the one that everyone was talking about, in the city. So they come up to Philip, one of the disciples, uh, with this memorable request. Sir, they say, we would like to see Jesus. Jesus takes this request as an opportunity to talk about both his hour and his glory. Verse 23, he says, the hour has now come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He says, you want to see me? You, you've come at just the right time because now, imminently, you are going to see me glorified. 
The Greeks have come with great expectations to Jerusalem for the Passover. Uh, they want to experience the famous festival. We read they've come to worship, even though they're, they're not Jews. They've come to see the sights now to meet this new local celebrity and then to go home at the end of the week with memories and stories of the glories they've seen in the holy city. And Jesus has also come to Jerusalem in great expectation. He knows that this Passover week will be his moment that the, the climax of his ministry, the fulfilment of his calling, what he will be remembered for. And so he begins to talk about the kind of glory that he's heading for. But it's not what those Greeks are expecting. If they want beautiful memories, they'd better look elsewhere. What does the word glory mean to you? What images does it conjure up? If you think of the glory of God, what do you see or what do you hear? A throne in heaven, a choir of angels, uh, the vastness and the wonder of the universe, God's creation. Uh, in this book, um, the, the Word Made Flesh, uh, the author Eugene Peterson writes about his uh, early associations with the word glory. He writes this, he says, I, I acquired a feel for the many dimensions contained in the word glory from my pastor when I was about 10 years old. He conveyed it in his voice. He was Welsh. His voice from the pulpit reverberated in a full Welsh timber and tonality throughout the sanctuary. When Pastor Jones spoke the word, it began low and rumbling like the 16 foot pipes in an organ. It gathered volume and resonance until it filled the sanctuary, the sound filling not only our ears, but our hearts. Most people articulate the word in two syllables, glory. In Pastor Jones, it was multi-syllables, glory, in an ascending scale of decibels and pitch. It was years before I learned the dictionary meaning of the word. But from Pastor Jones, I knew its meaning. It means something magnificent is going on, is coming together, something that has to do with God and us, something transforming, enlivening and wonderful. The glory of God. How does this word glory connect with me? How does the glory of God in all its magnificence take root in my life? How is it displayed and experienced? How does it take root as I come to church and go to work, as I read the news and check my Facebook feed, as I navigate the gradual lifting of lockdown and make another meal for my family? How does it take root as, as I get cancer and deal with the frailties of old age or as I celebrate anniversaries and have to cancel a holiday. Does glory have any connection with my life? Or is it all about God up in heaven with the angels? How does glory take root in my life? Jesus makes the connection. He says, verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you, Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The, the image of the seed is a picture of Jesus' forthcoming death. But it's also a pattern for the Christian life, for, for anyone who chooses to follow him. Verses 25 and 26 make that very clear. The, the roots of glory are in suffering burial and death. I've preached on this passage twice since the outbreak of COVID-19. Firstly on Palm Sunday and now today. On, on Palm Sunday I used the illustration of, of a conquer, conquer seed. I've actually stolen it from Marcia who used it in her sermon uh, in February but it's a good one so we'll have it for the third time. You remember playing conquers at school? Probably a long time ago but I'm Sure, you remember how it works. The winning conquer is the one that has smashed up all the others. The, the, the glory 
goes to the one that has survived, held it together, lived to fight again. But that's not how conquerors are supposed to work. That's not how they fulfill their purpose. A conqueror is a seed. Its purpose, its calling, is to be buried and to die, to fall apart, and only then to live and bring life. Think of the glory of a, a fully grown, a mature horse chestnut tree. Its roots are in death and burial. It's as if there are two options for a conquer. To, to win the fight, become the champion of the playground, or the far greater glory of the tree. But it has to die. So it is for Jesus and for those who choose to follow him. I said that we have two prayers in this passage, a prayer that Jesus didn't pray and a prayer that Jesus did pray. We, we see them in verses 27 and 28. Now, says Jesus, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. The first prayer is, Father, save me from this hour. The second is, Father, glorify your name. And it's as if Jesus gets the two options out on the table, considering which one to use. We see something similar in the other Gospels when they describe Jesus's agonised prayers in Gethsemane. Is Jesus going to seek his own comfort or God's glory and will? And with the two options before him, Jesus chooses the second prayer, the costly path of obedience to God's call and glory through suffering. He rejects the first prayer. It may be that sometimes the prayers we don't pray are as significant as the prayers we do pray. When we're young, in years or, or in faith, our prayers tend to revolve entirely around our own desires and problems. If we're honest, most of us mostly still pray like this, even after we've been Christians for many years. But sometimes, as we gradually grow in maturity in prayer, we start to focus more on God's glory and will and less on our own immediate needs. And more than that, we come to accept that very often the way of God's glory, his glory revealed in our life, his glorious purposes, that the way of God's glory is not through escape, and rescue from the problems ahead of us, but rather by continuing through them. Of course, there are plenty of encouragements in the Bible for us to pray earnestly for God's rescue, for his healing, uh, for power to overcome problems. There is a time for regular prayers like these. But we don't always see the victory or the healing or the rescue that we desire. And there is a theme running right through scripture and coming to a point precisely in the life and the teaching and the prayers of Jesus of strength in weakness of glory through suffering. And sometimes we learn this in prayer or, we, or we, we begin to put it into practice in prayer. And perhaps as much by deciding what we're not going to pray for as what we are going to pray for. Is prayer a mechanism uh, like a car jack where we, where we lever ourselves up higher to gain better access uh, to God? Or is prayer a process where I choose to lower myself, to become less, to die to self and selfishness? The Apostle Paul spoke about his prayer life in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that once he said, once he was raised up to the third heaven to see inexpressible glories. But the rest of the time, most of the time, 
He was down on the earth amidst hardships and weaknesses and persecutions and difficulties, learning that God's power is made perfect in weakness and his glory revealed through suffering. This teaching, importantly, is not simply suffering in this life and then glory in the next. Kind of suck it up now, when you get to heaven, it will be okay. Of course, ultimate glory lies in eternity, where we will see the glory of God and ourselves be glorified. Then we will know freedom from sin and suffering and sorrow. But it, it begins now as we learn to die to self and selfishness and to live with suffering and find that this is the path to glory. Eugene Peterson, again, he, he writes this. He says, here is a wonderful thing that begins to come into focus. We don't have to wait until we die before we die. We don't have to wait until after our funerals to get in on the glory. As St. Teresa used to say, the pay starts in this life. There are two prayers of Jesus in this passage. The one he, he didn't pray and the one he did. And in our own prayer lives, it helps that it at least occurred to Jesus not to pray for glory through suffering, but to pray for rescue from it. It makes it possible for me to reject my me first self-serving prayers and to choose to go deeper in prayer and accept a more costly glory. Let's pray. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs, outweighs them all. Lord Jesus, help us to follow you in the pattern of your calling and help us to pray like you, to say no to self, and seek your Father's glory above all things and in all things. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless.